All right, I'm going to talk about script in Bitcoin. This is a half hour talk. Um, and again, I'm going to talk at quite a high level about script, just like I did for digital signatures. Um, I'm going to talk about why we have script and more generally the, the design philosophy of script and white and contracts on a blockchain. And I'll give you a couple of script examples, how those are executed. What I'm not going to talk about is an exploration of the semantics of the script language. And I'm not going to give a description of all the common Bitcoin transaction output types. Why? Because you can look at those in a book. I, I don't think it's very useful to talk about the, the data structures or the code. But I, I do hope to give you a sense of what we think about when we think about contracts in Bitcoin. So I'll talk about why we have script. I'll talk about locking an output or a coin and unlocking it. I'll give a couple of examples of the stack for pay to pub key and multi-sig. And then I'll just touch briefly, briefly on the role of a blockchain, whether it's computing or verifying. OK, so why do we have script at all? In my first talk, I talked about digital signatures and, and using digital signatures to transfer coins from one owner to another. Why did Satoshi add script? Well, with those digital signatures, with a chain of signatures, that allows a coin to be moved from one person to another person to another person. But what if I want my coin to be spendable when two out of three people sign, right? So that this might be an escrow service or some cold wallet service. How do I do that? What if I want my coin to be spendable when someone presents a secret or a secret value, for example, the pre-image to a hash digest? What if I want a coin to be spendable after a certain amount of time? What if, what if, what if? So instead of creating lots of different special transaction types, um, Satoshi added, added a generic scripting language. So users of Bitcoin could specify um, encumbrances or conditions for spending coins. Now that wasn't mentioned in the white paper and it may be that script was added quite late into the development of the Bitcoin source code before release. Early versions of script were very buggy. For example, anyone could spend anyone's coins. That's a, that's a bit of a bug, um, which suggests that maybe the implementation was a little bit rushed. Okay, what is script? Um, in Bitcoin, a contract is what we call a predicate. It takes some inputs and it outputs either true or false. And those inputs are the transaction and some additional data provided by the person spending the coin. And it returns true or false. True, the transaction is valid. This is a valid spend of the coin. Or false, the transaction is invalid. Contracts in Bitcoin are implemented as programs. And those programs are written in a programming language called script, which is an unfortunate name, but there we go. Script is a stack-based language, and that means that every item in that language either pushes elements onto a stack or acts on elements on that stack, either removing them or doing something to them, inspecting them in some way. And at the end of execution, if the, scrap, if the stack is non-empty and the top element is non-zero, then that is true. Otherwise, the script is evaluated to false. OK, so how do we lock a coin and encumber it with some kind of condition? And how do we unlock it? A transaction output is locked with conditions. And the input unlocks it by satisfying those conditions. The locking conditions are encoded in a script, which we call script pub key. That's the name of the, the variable within the source code. And the unlocking proof or conditions are encoded in a script sig. Early versions of Bitcoin, so v0.1 up to 0.3.8, simply concatenated those scripts together and ran them. And if it evaluated the true, then that was a valid spend. Now, unfortunately, that's broken. And if you do that, anyone can spend anyone's coins. I won't explain why. It's, it's quite a fun exercise to see if you can work out once, 
once you know how script works, how you could spend anyone else's coins under this system, but it was broken. And so in v0.3.8, that was changed, fixed, by running the script separately. So first you run the script sig, and that places elements onto the stack. You leave those elements there, and then you run the script pub key. Um, note that because the spender is providing the script sig, it doesn't really need to be, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a script. It could just be placing elements onto the stack, right? So it shouldn't really be a script. It's just providing data elements. That's a script sig. So for example, here's an example locking condition. The simplest script pub key, um, sorry, the, 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 the slides that I gave for translation said script sig, it should say script pub key there. Um, I'll send out corrected slides. So the simplest script pub key is called pay to pub key or P2PK. And the condition for spending a P to PK output is signing a message with the private key corresponding to the given public key. That message, the message that the signer must sign, is a part of the transaction that they are that they are signing. Um, and, and we talked about how digital signatures worked in the first talk. So this is this is just a digital signature over the transaction or parts of that transaction. And incidentally, this is why it's called um, script pub key because the script pub key contains a pub key, and script sig because the script sig contains a signature. Okay, multi-sig is, is another very common type of transaction um, output. And a multi-sig is used when you want your coins to be encumbered with K out of N parties signing. So the condition for spending a multi-sig is that you must sign a message with K private keys out of the N public keys given in the locking script. And the message that we sign is the same for each of those public keys it's a part of the transaction that you're spending. All right, next up is pay to pub key hash. And in pay to pub key hash, the locking script, the uh, script pub key, is the hash digest of the public key. And the conditions for spending are providing a public key that hashes to that digest and a signature of a message with the private key corresponding to that pub key. Any questions so far? Does it all kind of make sense? All right, next up is pay to script hash. Um, and pay to script hash locks an output with some arbitrary script. And you just provide the hash digest of that arbitrary script. And the condition for spending that is providing a script that hashes to that digest, plus the data required to satisfy the locking conditions on that script. Right, so the, the spender provides a script in this case. So what, why, why P2SH? Why do we do this? Why, why when we send a coin do we just use a hash instead of giving the whole script? Well, it means that the script pub key is a uniform small size. It's 32 bytes plus a bit of filler. And the sender, the person sending the coins, does not need to know the spending conditions for what they're sending. So if I want you to send to me, and for some reason I want the spending conditions to be I can't spend after some amount of time, or it needs to be a multi-sig, or whatever conditions I want to put on that output, you don't need to know about that if you're sending it to me. I just give you the hash of the script and you send to that hash. The receiver, that's me who's put the conditions on, I pay the additional fee if it's a large or complex script. And the script pub key, because it's just a hash, it's a uniform template, it's hash plus some opcodes, that can be encoded in an address, we have an address format for pay to script hash. And then some newer ones, pay to witness pub key hash and pay to witness script hash. These are new locking conditions with SegWit, bit 141, which was in the last talk. Pay to witness pub key hash, pay to script hash. And th these are similar to before. And the key difference is that the data required 
to satisfy the conditions is carried in a separate, a separate structure called the witness. That's why it's called segregated witness. And that witness is not covered in the transaction ID. That's what fixes the malleability. So those are all the common types of transaction output or script. I'm going to talk very quickly about two, two of those, two of those standard transaction types, um, and just show you what it looks like on the stack when we're executing those scripts. So pay, pay to public key, this is the easiest, most straightforward transaction output type. The script pub key contains a public key, and that's 33 bytes if you're using compressed pub keys plus the op check sig op code. And the script sig, that's what the, the spender of that coin provides, is just a signature. And that's usually 71, maybe 72, 73 bytes. It's a variable length. So before execution, you have your, your script sig. This is provided by the spender, the person spending the coins. And you have your script pub key. That is provided by the person sending the coins. And first of all, you, ex you execute script sig. And because it's just a data element, that data element gets put onto the stack. So after you've, after you've executed script sig, you're, you end up with a stack with a signature on. Your script sig is empty, and you haven't done anything with the script pub key yet. Next, you execute script pub key. So the first element is pub key. That's a data element. You just push that onto the top of the stack. And then the next element in the script pub key is this opcode, opcheck-sig. That takes a look at the two elements in the stack and verifies that the signature is a true signature for that pub key. If it is, it pushes one to the stack. And we're done. Now, the stack is not empty. And the top element here, one, is non-zero. So that evaluates to true. Any questions about that? OK, pretty straightforward. Multisig, um, again, quite straightforward. For a KFN multisig, the script pub key, so this is a locking condition, contains the number K. That's how many people I need to sign. That's one byte, usually. Um, all N public keys, and again, those are 33 bytes each if we're using compressed pub keys or 65 bytes if they're uncompressed. And then the number n, that's the number of public keys. And then op check multisig, that's another op code, one byte. And the script sig, this is what's unlocking, this is what the spender provides, contains a dummy byte, because there's an off by one error. And then k signatures, each of which are usually 71 bytes. So again, this is what our, stack, our script pub key and script sig look like before execution. The stack is empty. So first of all, we execute script sig. And these are all data elements. So we, we see 0 at the top. We execute that by putting it onto the stack, and then sig 1, and then sig 2. Right? So it's reverse the order. That's what it looks like after script sig execution. And then script pub key execution. Again, you've got a bunch of data elements. These all just get pushed onto the stack. So you get two pushed onto the stack, and then pub key one pushed onto the stack, and then pub key two pushed onto the stack. And then you have the op check multisig. That takes a look at all of the elements on the stack. It's, it sees three. It reads three pub keys. It sees two and says, OK, I need two signatures. Here are two signatures, and then it just accidentally picks up an extra element. That's the way it was implemented. Um, and if these signatures are true signatures for some of these pub keys, then it pushes a one onto the stack. And that's what it looks like at the end of execution. Yeah. Sorry, say that again? Yeah, this is bare multi-sig, um, and it's expensive because it's using up a lot of, um, it's using data in the UTXO set, so it, it, it costs extra fee to do this. Usually, multi-sig would be wrapped into a, a P2SH. Yeah. Any other questions on, 
on that. Okay, so once that object multi-sig is run, it pushes a one onto the stack. We're done with execution because we've drained our, our script pub key and we're left with a one on the stack. So the, the stack is non-empty, the top element is non-zero, and so this evaluates to true. Any, any questions about that? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna finish with a kind of philosophical uh, ramble about computing and verifying on a blockchain. So as I said before, a contract is a predicate. Right? It takes inputs and it outputs either true or false. And Bitcoin nodes, when they're verifying transactions in the blockchain, they're only interested in whether that contract, contract evaluates to true. Right? We're not interested in how it gets to true, we just need to know that the output is true and not false. Now Bitcoin, the way it's implemented, uses script, which is a language which is interpreted and executed by every node. And so we're doing a computation, right? We're doing, we're repeating all the steps in a computation, in a computer program. But really, we're only doing that because we're interested in verification. We're only interested in the output. It doesn't really matter how we get there. Um, now, adding more com computational workload to contract execution does not scale. It's, it's a really bad way of scaling a blockchain. Verification is much easier and more scalable than computation, especially, especially if we have things like aggregate signatures or batch validation for multiple signatures. If we have every contract is just some arbitrary program in some Turing complete language, then that makes for an unscalable blockchain. So at the limit, a blockchain could use zero knowledge proofs instead of script execution, right? So really, we just need a proof. We don't need the execution. But at the margin, there are lots of technologies in Bitcoin that can improve scalability by only committing minimal data to the blockchain. Right, so instead of having the whole script on the blockchain or all of the conditions on the blockchain, if you can provide a proof that the conditions have been met, that's a lot more efficient, scalable. What are some examples of this? Well, only reveal the spending conditions at time of spend is good for scaling because it means those spending conditions don't need to be stored by every node before that coin gets spent. And we do that with pay to script hash or pay to witness script hash. Um, those, are, those are good for scalability because the UTXO set that every node keeps does not need to store the spending conditions of every coin. We can batch multiple payments into one on-chain commitment. So we do that with layer two, things like Lightning. So one on-chain transaction for Lightning is um, encapsulating tens or hundreds or thousands of off-chain transactions, but we just finish with a proof that this is the final state, the final transaction. We could create a script where we only reveal the branch of the script or the branch of the contract that was executed. And technologies that do that are things like MAST or Taproot, which we don't yet have in Bitcoin, but maybe in a future soft fork, we will have that. So if we have a contract which says we can spend these coins if condition A or condition B or condition C. Instead of revealing all of those, we just reveal condition A with the proof that we've satisfied that. Um, in the best case where everyone agrees, instead of showing a script, just broadcast a single threshold signature. Um, Taproot and graft roots are examples of doing that. And that's really efficient because if you just have a signal signature, you can batch validate that with all of the other signatures in the in the block, for example, and it's really quick. Um, you can combine multiple signatures into a single signature, so that's threshold. Signatures in Schnorr is very easy to do. And then you could embed additional conditions or commitments into a digital signature. Um, things like adapter signatures and script scripts do that. So it's no coincidence that these technologies that I talk about here um, P2SH, Lightning, MAS, Taproot, Graphroot, Threshold Signatures. It's no coincidence that these are good for scaling, but they're also good for privacy and fungibility. 
Less data on the blockchain means better privacy for the people transacting. And transactions that look the same, more uniform transactions, are better for fungibility. So in conclusion, um, a Bitcoin output can be locked with a contract, so conditions on who's allowed to spend that output. And a contract is a predicate. It takes a transaction and additional data provided by the spender and returns true if it's a valid transaction or false if it's not. Bitcoin uses script to encode contracts and the witness data. So the witness data is this additional data that we provide to prove that we can spend or we fulfilled the conditions of that contract. And script is a stack-based language that executes on on all nodes. So if you're a full node and you want to verify the transactions, you execute the script for all of the transactions. And finally, a blockchain is for verifying, not computing. We happen to use computing, script, but what we're really interested in is are the conditions met, and, and that's verification. All right, any questions on that? Yes. Why is there no pay to witness pub key? Yeah. Um, this type of transaction is uh, wallet type uh, with bytes. Good question. Um, that was the way that SegWit was designed. There, there are two types of SegWit transaction pay to witness pub key hash, which is 20 bytes, and pay to witness script hash, which is 32 bytes. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the types of transaction that I've mentioned here are all standard transactions. So those are transact. that's nothing to do with um, consensus. Any transaction is permitted that uses the script language. But those transactions won't get propagated by full nodes to miners unless they're standard. And there are now seven types of standard transaction, pay to pub key, multi-sig, um, data, so op return, pay to script hash, pay to pub key hash, and now the two witness types. Yes, Taj. Pay, pay to pub key hash is optimal in terms of weight. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, one advantage of pay to pub key hash is you don't reveal your public key until the time of spending. Um, so pay to pub key is in absolute terms number of bytes smaller than pay to pub key hash, but pay to pub key hash aligns incentives better because it's better to have bytes in an input than bytes in an output. Any byte in an output needs to be stored in the UTXO set by every full node, whereas bytes in the input don't get stored in the UTXO set, they're in the blockchain, but they don't get stored in, in the UTXO set. So 
it's better to have a smaller output and a larger input. And SegWit incentivizes that by giving a discount to the signatures. So what Taj was saying is um, a pay to witness pub key, if it existed, would cost more because the weight, the, the adjusted cost of that transaction type would be greater than pay to witness pub key hash. The question was, what's the point of Ethereum? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, script is very limited. It's not Turing complete. So you can't have loops, for example. And the design philosophy behind Ethereum was that if you have a Turing complete language and if you have state saved on the blockchain, you can do create many additional applications. Now, I'm not sure I agree with that approach. In fact, I don't agree with that approach for the reasons that I, I, I state um, here that adding more computational workload to the blockchain does not scale. And even more adding arbitrary workload. So adding a Turing complete scripting language where you can have any kind of computation does not scale. Um, now, the people at the Ethereum Foundation claim that they can make it scale with sharding and various other technologies. That's yet to be seen. But if you have a, a very simple base layer, Bitcoin, where it's really, in the end, just verifying signatures, that is a lot more scalable when you build on top of it with layer two, things like Lightning and so on. Okay. It's, not it's no, no, no. Script is not Turing complete. I have time for one more question. Yes. I cannot. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.